What do most of our people do? They're sponsored by the state governments, the state departments of health. And this is a program, we, most people call it the Conrad program, after Senator Conrad from North uh, uh, Dakota who sponsored this. 30 people from each state can go ahead and apply for the program. It used to be 20. I've got to tell you just a little story about this because this is uh, my heyday as a legislator and the only time I'll ever be a sort of a politician. Um, back in 2001, uh, Senator Brownback was head of the immigration subcommittee for a very brief time, and I wrote a, a bill for, with his staff to get more nurses into the United States. And he said, Carl, do something so we can get more doctors going into underserved areas. And I said, okay, here's my idea. We take the uh, Conrad 20 program, we make it into the Conrad 100 program, and then everybody can get sponsored. And he said, well, you know, that's not really politically possible. Why don't we try the Conrad 40 program? And then he lost his committee chairmanship because the uh, Senate flipped from one party to another party. Um, and they, for, for a few weeks at home, my wife and my, uh, my kid, who's a doctor, were calling me Senator Schusterman. But after a while, my bill wasn't going through, or Senator Brownback's bill wasn't going through. But if you're really patient, you find out some of these things go through later on. The next year, the primary sponsoring agency, and you, you notice I didn't mention them, it's the U.S. Department of Agriculture. After 9-11, they dropped out of the sponsorship program for J doctors. So who was going to sponsor these J doctors? Senator Brownback brought up the idea of the uh, Brownback 40 program. They compromised on 30, and now it's, you know, now it's called the Conrad 30 program. So now they call me Senator Schusterman again around the dinner table. I'm very happy about it. Um, but it's these programs that we use 99% of the time to sponsor you. If you're in California, let's say, you're probably going to look for jobs either in inner city or somewhere in the Central Valley or in the Imperial Valley, wherever they have shortages. And whatever state it is, and I mean, we represent doctors in at least 45 of these different states. And on my webpage, I link to the person that we talk to in each state to see whether you're going to qualify. You get a job offer from that state. We have a job offer page, too, by the way. So, um, and once you get a job offer, we have to determine, number one, is the job offer, this is true for the state programs, it's true for the federal programs, is it in an underserved area? And the initials that you see on my slide for the underserved areas are HPSA, the health professional shortage areas, the MUAs, the medically underserved areas, and the MUPs, the medically underserved populations. Different facilities, especially jails and, uh, and hospitals in underserved areas, have their whole facility designated as an underserved area. And, and <clears throat> there is a place on the website where we link to the HHS website. And you can put in the address, and you'll get a census tract number. And with that census tract number, you'll be able to figure out if your job offer is in the underserved area. If it's not, forget it, because it's not going to get you sponsorship for the J waiver. If it is, then that's the time, you know, talk to us. Or if you can't figure out how do you work the system, believe me, we know how to work the system, call up myself or one of my attorneys in the office, and we'll go through and figure out whether your job offer is in an underserved area. Now, if it is in the underserved area, you have to get a recommendation from the IGA, the Interested Government Agency. Each agency can only sponsor 30 physicians a year, and some states fill up right away. I mean, we did uh, Texas last year. Texas filled up in 24 hours. Okay. California, on the other hand, here we are in uh, April, hasn't filled up yet at all, and it's already been over six months. So you have to kind of know your states, we always put in phone calls to the people at the state and say, what are you looking for? Some states prefer certain types of employers over other types of employers. Now, most of you are going to be sponsored not only by an interested government agency, but with one of the state 30 programs. 
and you have to know each of the programs. That's kind of a hard thing to do because there's at least 50 different programs and Guam and Puerto Rico and Washington DC, they all have their own programs. So there's really more than 50 programs. And that's what we do. We sit on the phone, we talk to the people who run the different programs. They're actually very friendly and they're very up on what their state needs. You know, which counties are really underserved, what kind of specialist or primary care physicians they need, which employers they're gonna sponsor and uh, which ones they're not. So you can look up and get sort of a preview of this by looking at my website. Not, not all the 50 programs have their own websites, but most of them do, and I link to the website. Sometimes when they don't have their website, I have them fax me their requirements, and then I scan it in as a PDF file, and you can read what their requirements are. But in a pinch, you know, we, we call them and see, anything changed since you last updated your website? Um, you probably have your choice of most states, but let me tell you, there are states that fill up very quickly, like Michigan and Texas. Last year, Texas filled up in 24 hours. So we had, right on September 30th, we had our FedEx packages for all our doctors who wanted to work in the Rio Grande Valley and South Texas and stuff. And boom, Connie Barry, who's the head of the Texas program, she got our FedExes that very first morning because if they weren't in until October the 2nd, you were finished as far as going through Texas. Um, states like California, on the other hand, only sponsor primary care physicians, so they don't fill up. So here we are at the end of April, and you can still go ahead and apply in California. And they only have a couple of physicians left, but you can still apply. So how does, how does it all work? You want to apply through the state. So number one, you got to get the IGA, the State Conrad Program, to write a recommendation letter saying, we want you to fill one of the 30 slots, okay? That goes over to the State Department. And the State Department is the one who administers the J-1 program. You signed a piece of paper saying you're going to go back for two years, and now you're saying you're not going to go back for two years. So they have to decide whether to allow you to escape from that two-year foreign residency requirement. Used to be pretty tough. Now, I haven't seen in years a doctor that the State Department has rejected from that program. I'm sure there's a couple, but I haven't seen them. And then finally, the application goes over to CIS, the Citizenship and Immigration Services, and they give you something in the mail showing that you've got a waiver. Now, when you get your waiver, what you want to do is transfer on to an H-1B visa. By the way, how about timing? When, when do you start the waiver application? Well, if you're smart, you'll start it right near the beginning of your last year of your residency or fellowship. It's amazing how many people I get. They come to me in March and they say, I'm going to be finished with my fellowship in, in June and I need a waiver. And we got three months to do it. It can't be done in three months. Uh, usually, I, I'll tell people six to eight months is a more realistic time frame. Um, but there are some things you can do, like you can extend your J to take specialty exams. ECFMG will let you do this. And you can also do something, I, I mean, I hate to say it on the video, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, if you're a resident, you can enroll in a fellowship, and then you'll have to drop the fellowship and you take, you know, you get the fellowship to continue to your J waiver status. It's something that I hate to see people do because somebody else probably could have used your fellowship. Um, but you should try to keep yourself legal in the United States. What happens if you don't? What happens if your J runs out? Well, the, the J, fortunately, if it only runs out for a few months, we can still send you back to your country to get an H-1B visa stamped in your passport. If you're you know, a year or more out of J status, you can pretty much forget getting a J waiver. It's just nobody's gonna sponsor you in that case. But if it's only a few months, you're probably gonna be okay. Now, what are the requirements? You got your J waiver, what do you have to do 